Hey everybody, just wanted to uh, go ahead and get on here to uh, make sure everything was on and working. Um, trying to get my laptop screen up here so that I can see folks. And I cannot yet, so what is going on? Okay, yeah, there we go. All right. Okay, looks like modern technology is kicking in here. All right, let's get going. First of all, let me thank you for taking the time to uh, tune in and uh, listen to what I got to say. Hopefully I won't ramble and bore you. Um, I have to say that I have a fairly inquisitive mind, so I, I kind of get thinking about stuff sometimes, and I have to just investigate it until I uh, am uh, thoroughly engrossed in the subject. But I, I just wanted to, uh, to take a few minutes just to kind of tell you a couple stories, and uh, um, we'll kind of drag all of, all of it back together and hopefully form some kind of a, uh, um, of a thought or moral or whatever you want to uh, title it. But anyway, let's get started. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to see you on my laptop screen, so if you tune in, I can give you a shout out. Also, uh, if you have the, uh, uh, I think you can go to the top of your page and uh, uh, turn on notifications for this page so that when I do a, a live, you'll be able to see it and it'll, it'll come right up on your news feed. But I'm going to tell you about three um, heroes. Uh, if, uh, if you saw my little snippet just a few minutes ago, I'm calling this uh, heroes and villains, or heroes and crooks, I think is the is way I put it on there. But uh, the first one I want to tell you about is a guy by the name of David McConnell. David McConnell uh, was a book salesman back in the late 1800s, 1879 to be exact. Um, one day he called on the home of a lady by the name of Persis Foster Eames Albee, who went later on to be known as P.F.E. Albee, I think is the way that uh, um, she required, uh, re, uh, re, wanted everybody to call her. Anyway, after uh, during this visit, they, they kind of struck up a uh, conversation and a relationship, and uh, McConnell hired Miss Alby to be a sales agent for him. Now, she started part-time at first, but uh, because she also had a store in her house that she operated. But um, they were always looking for ways to improve the sales of their books, so they came up with the idea of putting a perfume sample uh, in with every book that they sold. And they learned that the perfume samples were, was the reason that people were buying their books. So then they started selling the perfume. And in 1886, McConnell started uh, the California Perfume Company. And Albie was one of his most successful dealers. And uh, within a very short period of time, she was... Um, allowed to start uh, recruiting other salespeople for their organization. She was uh, already a reputable business person in her hometown, so uh, women uh, paid attention to her when she talked. So the first year that they were in business, uh, she recruited over 100 women to sell for them. And they, uh, they developed a direct door-to-door -door selling method of, of low pressure type sales of women to women. And it allowed uh, women at that time to develop an income separate from their husband or even separate from the fact that if they didn't have a husband, which was very uh, unusual at that time. 
Um, as you can imagine, our male-dominated society today was even worse back in those days. So um, these hundred women uh, were self-managed. They did their own thing. They worked when they wanted to, but they sold California Perfume Company's line of products. Now, during her 25-year career, Miss Alby uh, trained more than 5,000 representatives to sell the perfume and the other cosmetic pro products that they had come up with. Not long after her death, the company, the California Perfume Company, would become known as Avon. So Miss Alby was the very first Avon lady. My second hero is a gentleman by the name of Joseph Wachter. He was a, an accomplished concert pianist in Eastern Europe and at, at a very young age became very popular on the uh, concert circus. So because of his increase in popularity and the, the uh, rigors of his schedule, he tend to neglect his health and uh, personal well-being at the uh, cost of his piano playing um, and therefore became uh, very sick. At the age of 17, he passed out in a concert hall in Vienna and was taken home. Uh, doctors examined him and told him that he had um, tuberculosis, had contracted, contacted tuberculosis and had less than six months to live. So he, uh, he abandoned his uh, concert career and did what a lot of people would do in that particular situation with a short period of time to live. He wanted to see as much of the world as he could. So he started traveling through Europe and France and um, came up through the southeastern uh, part of Alaska and ended up staying there for quite some time. Became friends with a young writer by the name of Jack London. Um, I think any, uh, any school kid my age, and hopefully even today, would know who Jack London was and uh, had the stories that he had written. But while in, while in Alaska, he became um, familiar with the Native Americans in Alaska the Klingit and the Haida Indians um, and their ways of nutrition and natural healing. He actually uh, uh, put himself in their hands to um, heal and miraculously did healing. His tuberculosis was completely cured and he owed his uh, healing to the fact that they used uh, plants uh, from the sea. So he took his idea, took this idea of plant-based nutrition um, to heart and came up with an idea. And at that time, after uh, uh, becoming um, uh, strong enough to, to uh, withstand the rigors of travel, he set out walking all the way from Nome, Alaska to New York City, modern day or, or a, uh, uh, not modern day, but a real Forrest Gump. He walked over 10,000 miles uh, to New York City and then after that journeyed all the way back to California. And on his journey back to California he studied the um, uh, the healing practices of Native Americans in the lower um, 48 states or not, at that time not um, the lower part of the uh, North American continent. So not long after getting to uh, California, he contract, contacted a lady uh, professor by the name of Josephine Tilden, and they began exploring the various species of uh, sea vegetation and create the foundation for the Wachter's exclusive brand of sea vegetation. And from that, they started the company Wachter's Organic Sea Products in 1932. 86 years ago. They went on to use the distributor uh, ship model to market their, their products and became very successful and is actually still in existence today. Final, uh, third and final um, hero 
is a gentleman by the name of Carl Renborg. In 1915, while uh, Mr. Renborg was working in China, um, he learned firsthand the power of a plant-based diet. And he became very inquisitive of this. So he started studying the different um, uh, nutritional patterns of people that lived in big cities and people that lived in the more, more rural communities. And he found that the ones in the more rural communities tended to have better health because they ate less salt, less fat, less sugar. Um, and this, this gave him the idea to really get involved in the diet patterns of the people in the rural areas of China. Now, in 1927, uh, during some uh, political unrest in China, he was imprisoned in uh, Shanghai. And while he was there, he, he, uh, food was almost non-existent, and he um, survived by making soups of grasses and plants, and then uh, he would grind up uh, animal bones and even used... Um, uh, rusty nails to get the iron out of it and uh, was able to withstand the the rigors of uh, prison life so in 1927 um, or, or not not I'm sorry not 1927 but when he was 40 years old already out of the uh, the prison camps he left China and went back to California at $24 in his pocket He'd survived the ordeal, returned to the United States with an idea. That idea was that, could it be possible that there was some kind of supplement that could provide all the vitamins, minerals, and associated food factors lacking in people's diets? Years later, he was quoted as saying, I was flat on my back and broke, but I was rich because I had a dream and I was going to pursue it at all cost. In 1934, with this idea in, as the foundation, he began his business and introduced the first multivitamin, multimineral supplement for sale in North, in North America. He called it Vita-6, and it contained a liquid extract of alfalfa and other plant nutrients. 1939, he renamed his company Neutralite, Neutralite Products Incorporated. 1945 saw a change in the Neutralite uh, sales method. Two guys, one by the name of Lee Meidinger and William Castleberry, they retained exclusive rights to um, become national distributors of Neutralite food supplements and the beginning of multi-level marketing was begun. Now, shortly, um, a, few, a few years after they became the um, national distributors, two young high school buddies, one named Jay Van Andel and the other Rich DeVos, became distributors for the Neutralite um, supplements. And they became very successful at it. At, at their peak, they had uh, over 2,000 distributors. Now, a couple years prior to them coming on, the FDA uh, kind of honed in on Neutralite and some of the claims that they were making about their products and their um, effectiveness for a person's health. So for the next four years, they, uh, uh, Castleberry, Mittinger, and Renborg had to fight this battle and, and they ended up making several concessions uh, about their product, uh, nothing about their sales model. It was just about the way that they uh, marketed uh, or the claims that they made of their product. But in 1951, uh, the court issued a permanent injunction forbidding anyone who sold Neutralite products from referring to any edition of a of a pamphlet called How to Get Well and Stay Well, and more than 50 other publications that exaggerated the importance of food supplements. Now, this kind of scared the two young guys, um, Van Andel and Rich DeVos, 
So they decided that in able to protect their 2,000 distributors, they were going to separate from Neutralite and they started a company of their own called the American Way Association. They began um, marketing biodegradable uh, soap and other household cleaning products and uh, went on to diversify that line with beauty aids, uh, jewelry, furniture, and several other things because they shortened the name of their uh, company, took the name American Way and abbreviated it to become Amway. In 1972, as a turn of, uh, of events, Amway acquired the controlling interest of Neutralite Products Incorporated. Neutralite distributors became Amway distributors and Amway distributors became Neutralite uh, distributors. So the, these three uh, companies, or these three people, these three heroes that I have, started um, what we now know as network marketing. Now, they, they will argue back and forth as to who was first and all that kind of thing. Technically, the, uh, the Neutralite um, company was the first to use a complete model as we have today of um, network marketing. But Miss Alvey back in the 1800s also used a similar uh, form of that. And obviously when um, Avon came along at, or the, uh, the California Perfume Company became Avon, uh, they continued that model. But regardless of the fact, the point that I wanted to make from this is that network marketing has been around since the early uh, 1900s, officially in the late um, uh, 30s. But it's a system that works. Um, it's certainly had its troubles. It certainly had its, uh, its villains. And that's who I'm going to tell you about now. Um, some of the most uh, prominent vil villains that have come down the line have been companies that uh, take the model of network marketing and pervert it to the point that um, they start paying people to recruit people. So it, it wasn't that necessarily a product was involved for that matter, it could be, um, but the ones that, that I'm fixing to tell you about didn't actually have a product. They rewarded people for signing people up. The first one I wanna tell you about is was called uh, Burn lounge burn lounge and that one uh, it was in the early 2000s so it's a fairly uh, recent one they um, offered the opportunity to 30,000 people including major label musicians and the deal was simple uh, you opened up a, an, a storefront through your page online record store and they were required to pay a subscription fee. Those who sold songs were paid um, royalties or, or uh, premiums or commissions or whatever you want to call it. And they were also given points that had to be redeemed for um, burn lounge products, not for money. Now, ultimately, uh, their whole pay for the right to sell and earn bonuses Caught the, uh, caught the eyes of the FTC, and they were shut down very quickly. The operators were ordered to pay $17 million to refund the cons what consumers had, uh, had lost in that, um, in that company. As I mentioned earlier, uh, these, these uh, scams, or what we know as pyramid schemes, um, all offer the uh, the proverbial uh, too good to be true kind of thing. Um, some of them didn't even have the the name um, of the product or what it was doing in their name. One of those uh, came up in 2008 um, during the recession, uh, and this one happened in Canada. People were offered um, a chance to make up to $100,000 by upselling 
very cheap vacation club packages. Now, there was a $3,200 buy-in in return for a commission of $5,000 for every one of these that you sold. 2,000 people were duped uh, by this company and it was called Business in Motion. They launched a class action lawsuit and were awarded $6.5 million. And the man behind the scheme uh, faced deportation back to the United, Can United Kingdom. The third one that I want to tell you about was called Fortune High Tech Marketing. It was a Kentucky-based um, company. They recruited people to sell products um, like Dish Network uh, that, or different cell phone providers, uh, Front Point, Home Security, Health and Beauty products. And it was uh, deemed a, a pyramid scheme by the uh, FTC in 2013. The salespeople made more made money from recruiting uh, distributors. They didn't, um, even though they had a product, their focus was on recruiting people, and they were they were perf uh, they were paid a bounty for getting these people to sign up. They estimated FTC estimated that three hundred and fifty thousand people in the United States, Puerto Rico, and Canada bought into this scheme. They paid. Uh, $100 to $300 in annual fees and additional payments to get into higher brackets of commissions. The, um, the operators were banned from participating in multi-level marketing and they were forced to pay $7.75 million in assets back to the, computer, uh, to the consumers uh, that were duped by this, by this scheme. The, the point that I'm trying to um, to make, if if I've disguised it in some way, I'm I'm sorry. But the point that I was trying to make is that every time one of these crooks shows up on the radar, they're very quickly put away by the FTC or the FDA or one of our government bodies um, because they watch our industry very very critically. Um, I doubt that there's ever been a multi-level marketing company that did not come under scrutiny at some point or other uh, by the FTC or the FDA or whatever. Um, those that are still around are, are legitimate businesses. They've passed the test. Um, they sell a product and the focus is on selling a product or service, not on recruiting people. So. I talk to people every day and, and I get this uh, constantly that multi-level marketing or network marketing, social marketing, whatever you want to label it, is a pyramid scheme. And my answer to that is no, uh, it's really not. Although the structure of the company is in the form of a pyramid, meaning that there's a person at the top and, and people down below that. If you look at the, um, uh, the structure of any corporation, from Chevrolet to uh, AT&T or any company, every um, management structure is in the shape of a pyramid at some, at some degree. So the shape has nothing to do with it. The, the key word there is scheme because a scheme means that somebody's gonna get taken. And if that's the case, then that also means that they're gonna try and get their money and get out of it very quickly and uh, leave people in their wake. And that's why the FTC uh, is very quick to um, examine companies to make sure that they are on the up and up. And if you read my blog uh, yesterday, um, you would already be familiar with what I'm fixing to tell you. If you didn't, shame on you, go back and read it. Um, but the, the thing of it is, is that the, the network marketing model works. It's not a get-rich scheme, and that's generally where people get taken. 
Um, it's, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, it's the proverbial too good to be true thing. If you're offered huge money for little, little investment um, and, and no product sold, or if you're offered the ability to get paid uh, commissions or a finder's fee or whatever for getting people to come into your organization, then the bells should be going off in your head because all of these are, are uh, or uh, I won't say all of them because that's too broad. The majority of those that are like that are actually uh, get rich schemes um, and they're not going to work. They're not gonna stick around. They will be put out of business. We're very critical of, of our own industry. We watch other uh, companies that come into into view because it's kind of like the uh, um, shiny object sy uh, syndrome. As soon as a new one comes on the on the uh, horizon, people start paying attention to it, and you hear things, and um, then sooner or later it goes away. Those that stay, those that are still here are legitimate businesses and they are a uh, an excellent way of making a living or making extra money or whatever you want to make out of it now i will tell you this as i said in my blog and again shame on you if you didn't go read my blog there's going to be uh, visitations in your dream or something tonight because you didn't so you better get over there and read it but the the business is not easy it's not um, something that you're going to um, just get into and immediately start making money it's not any different than starting any other kind of business it takes time generally however it takes less time to build a, a an income producing business as a multi-level marketer or as a network marketer um, than it does to do a traditional brick and mortar uh, store. So I'm, I'm very um, uh, sensitive, I guess, to the fact that our industry gets maligned a lot. So it's kind of a, a, a burr under my saddle that I want people to know that, that we are legitimate business people and that we um, do sell services, products that are necessary that are needed um, that are good that actually deliver on their promises um, and it's something that i i think is worthy enough for everyone to look at now everyone's not cut out for this business because i said it's hard um, it will stretch you beyond belief as a person you will learn more about yourself than you do about anybody because you have to uh, uh, confront your personality traits that that uh, um, aren't good for you you'll you'll become a better person you become a better um, civilian you'll be you'll become a better um, mom a better dad a better brother better sister you just become a better person in addition to making money now that's the end of my sermon but I do want to tell you, um, as I did in my blog, and I'm going to tell you one more time, shame on you if you didn't go read my blog, so get over there and read it. Um, but for the next few weeks, through the month of August, I'm going to be doing um, two Facebook Lives a week on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, they're all going to be at 7 o'clock. They won't all be about network marketing, so don't, don't get that in your head so that you tune out. Some of them will be just about uh, how to live a better life. But I would like for you to, uh, to tune in and, and stay tuned in. Possibly uh, I could say something that might resonate in you. In addition to the two Facebook Lives, I will be putting out two blogs a week on Mondays and Wednesdays. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you should be able to get something um, some kind of, a, of an encouraging note or video from me. And I would appreciate any comments that you have. Keep your criticisms to yourself. No, just kidding. Um, if, if you have a criticism, put it out there. I'm a big boy, I can take it. 
but I would like to hear from you. Um, if something strikes a nerve with you or resonates in your body, then let me know that too, because uh, I'd like to know that what I do uh, matters. So anyway, that's the end of my uh, tirade tonight. Uh, we'll see you uh, Thursday night, and Thursday night is going to be, oh, my top five life hacks for a peaceful existence. So you won't want to miss that one. And again, get over and read my blog. See you later.